very pleased today to have a friend, colleagues, and somebody who been uh, in touch since many years. We've been part together of the ERS Junior Board back then in 2013. And now I'm very pleased to have her as a guest in one of our international grand rounds. Good morning, Marjorie. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Talks today is focused on biologics. And, and the question now everyone is asking, what are the risks for biologics? In an era when we had the pleasure and uh, being facilitated to use those biologics, now the, the question still remaining unclear. There are benefits, of course. Do we have risk? And that's the talk of today for uh, uh, Marjorie Cornet from the Netherlands. So if anyone is uh, interested, as always, you can type your question and we will reply to your question at the end of her presentation. So please, Marjorie, share your presentation. Yes, thank you very much. I will try to share it with you. Um, let me see. I think it should be, should be uh, visible for everyone now. So uh, um, as uh, Puya already introduced, I would li like to tell you not only about the biologicals because there are a lot of presentations about that, but more about the risks of prescribing them because they are getting more and more available for us ENT surgeons as well, which makes it very interesting. But the question is, uh, do, does, do they also have disadvantages? Um, so if you look at um, CRS with nasal polyps, because that's the main reason we prescribe patients biologicals, um, we know it's a very severe disease uh, and it has a very high burden, um, not only for the patient, because uh, the patient has had a lot of complaints, it's a chronic disease, but also um, on the economy of your country, because it's takes a lot of money for treatment, a lot of visits for the patients as well. And also surgery can be very expensive. Um, so that's why we are very happy that there are other options now um, to uh, try to make it better for the patients. Um, let me see. Let's go one back. So if you look at the biologics we have in this moment, um, for CRS with nasal polyps, we have three types of biologicals which are available for ENT surgeons. They're not available in every country, but I'm speaking now for the Netherlands. So we have the anti-IL-5, the mepolizumab, we have the anti-IgE, the omalizumab, and we have the anti-IL-4, IL-13, so which is the dupilumab. Um, and if you look in patients with asthma, there are even more biologicals. So they are a little bit ahead of us in the development of that. So uh, this pathway, I will not go totally into that because that's not the subject of today. Uh, but you can see, um, if you look here, here you see the anti 5 which is the mepolizumab, as I described. And for example, here uh, you have the anti 4 IL-13, and there you have the receptor antagonist, which is blocked by the dupilumab. So they both block different uh, places in the pathway, which uh, uh, will um, uh, lower the inflammation and relieve the symptoms for the patient. So if you look at biologicals um, for asthma with patients with CRS, um, in asthma, they are a little bit ahead of us and they um, did a lot more studies and also they looked at the side effects. So probably we can learn a lot from the side effects in, the, in these studies. So if you look at the effectiveness of omalizumab, mepolizumab, and dupilumab um, in these studies, you can see, um, I'll make it a little wider. Um, you can see that there are a lot of outcomes reported. And if you look at these big studies, um, we can find that there are, well, there are several side effects, um, some major, some minor, but they're very seldom. And what I would like to do, I would like to go through with you through all the side effects which are possible and the pro probable things that you should be uh, looking at when you prescribe your patients these medication. Um, let me see if we can go further. Yes. So, um, well, if you look at the most common side effects that we uh, that we see, um, it's especially fever, and it's in the range of one to 10%, which is quite high. Um, and fever is seen more in children. Well, in this case, for ENT only, we cannot prescribe biologicals to children yet, only from adults 18 years up. But if you look at asthma, fever is something they see a lot when they give the biologics. 
The second one, which is uh, very common, is the uh, uh, inject site reaction. Um, so you inject the biologicals, you inject it in your arm or in your upper leg, and people complain about itching, burning, feeling, and you see it more in patients who get dupilumab than other biologics. So if we continue with a lot, a lot of common uh, side effects, uh, the other one is headache, and it's both seen in adults, but also in children. Um, the only thing is that the most uh, people who complain from headache, they get it in the beginning of the treatment, but if they continue the treatment, the months after the headache will get less, which is always good to tell your patient. Um, nasopharyngitis is something which is mentioned in all uh, in all the um, uh, in all the uh, biologics uh, as a side effect, but actually clinically, um, because we prescribe it for the nose and, and patients already have nasal complaints, we do not hear patients complain about that. So that's mainly no reason to discontinue or to um, prescribe patients other medication. And abdominal pain is mostly seen in children. So children complain of headache as well, but more of abdominal pain. And that might be because for children, complaining about abdominal pain is more easy for them. It could be some, something similar like headache, and we cannot really explain why they get it, but it's something they complain a lot about. And also for these children, um, the side effects will get better when they continue the treatment. So if you look at the specific side effects uh, from dupilumab, which is good to know, is the herpes zoster infection. So this is, well, I think we all know, uh, acute viral infection of the nerve and the skin. And you can see a typical rash or sometimes even blisters on the skin, and it can be very painful. And it's caused by the varicella zoster virus. And in about one to 5% of the patients uh, can get it who get dupilumab. But I have to tell you, it's mainly in the patients who also have atopic dermatitis. So in the patients who have only CRS with polyps, we do not see it a lot. You can still have it because of some patients also have eczema. Um, but mainly in the atopic dermatitis group, this is seen um, a lot. So while all, uh, we are all uh, afraid of allergic reaction where we give new medication to, to patients, and this is also the reason that when you give it for the first time, you need to give it in the hospital. So, of course, you have to explain them how, how they can use the injection, uh, how, how they can use the medicine. Um, but we have to observe them for at least 30 minutes to see uh, if they get an anaphylactic reaction. Um, the reaction most of the time comes within the first period after the, after the injection, but can also be days after. And there can be several things that a patient can complain of. It can be swelling of the face, swelling of the lips, as you can see, um, but also sometimes fainting or dizziness. They can get a rash, a full body rash, and also hives. Um, in all the studies until now, if you look at all the literature uh, from the several biologicals, and uh, you can see here the reference uh, published in Allergy in 2020, it was uh, especially focused on the efficacy and safety of the treatment of biologics. So, uh, benralizumab, dupilumab, mepolizumab, omalizumab, and resolizumab. And you see only 0 0.01 to 0.02%. So, it's really, really low number. So the chance that they get an allergic reaction is very small. So if you look at adverse events, and this is also from the, from the same study in, from Allergy 2020, um, you see an increase in the likelihood of adverse events uh, when you give mepolizumab, benralizumab, or resolizumab, but you do not see it for dupilumab or omalizumab. So they're really, really safe and they don't, do not see any other side effects. So if you specifically look at the mepolizumab, uh, well, here we use the Nucala, um, it is said that it's safe from the age of six years old. So from six years old, you can prescribe it. Um, they say, do not use it when you have a parasitic infection. Well, that's because of the eosinophils. And do not use it when you are pregnant or you want to become pregnant. And um, there's, there's actually not a lot of evidence that it's harmful during pregnancy, but you really advise it not to prescribe it. So when you think of giving a patient 
uh, these types of medication, always ask them if they're planning to get pregnant in the near future, because it would be really sad if they have to discontinue their medication. Sometimes it's better to just start with the medication later on. So if you look at the Oma um, you see that it's effective for severe allergic asthma, also from patients from up to six years. Um, and also there is a significant effect on the size of polyps. So it's something we can give for polyps as well. Um, since 2020 in the Netherlands, it's available, available for polyps. And there's actually no adverse events reported um, with omalizumab. So it seems to be very safe. And also, if you look clinically, the patients who, who you prescribe this uh, medication, they really have no side effects and they are very happy. So the Dupic scent, it's something, it's, it's a really hot new uh, medication. And uh, here we, we, well, we can prescribe it and we prescribe it a lot, especially to patients with severe polyps um, who have um, recurrent disease after previous surgery, who have type two inflammation, who have anosmia, who have asthma. So all the comorbidities together and you can treat it, treat it as a whole. Uh, we tend to do it together with the pulmonologist. So we have um, um, a meeting with the pulmonologist to see how the lungs are doing and how the nose are doing. Um, so, and it's also approved for atopic dermatitis. So for all the three things. Um, and one of the major risks of the dupilumab, and this is also mainly seen in the patients with um, atopic dermatitis, is the conjunctivitis. And it's also seen in some patients with uh, CRS, but very seldomly. So you can forget it as an ENT surgeon, but if your patient also has atopic dermatitis, you should be aware of patients complaining of this. And it's even around 10% or more in this group. So it's seen very often. Um, most cases are very mild, sometimes moderate, and almost all cases recovered. But it's really something to be aware of. And if you have a patient with these side effects, you should always refer them to your um, ophthalmologists and dermatologists <clears throat> because they have the most experience with that. So if you further look into the dupilumab and the risks, you also have the hyper eosinophilia. So that means a temporary increase of the eosinophils. Um, well, most of the time by around 10%. <clears throat> and you see the eosinophils increase. Um, until a maximum of 16 to 20 weeks, and then they get slowly lower and lower. And you mainly see it in patients with asthma, not so much in atopic dermatitis. Um, well, most of these patients are asymptomatic. Um, and there are a few cases described who, uh, from patients who get an eosinophilic pneumonia um, and even some myositis. Um, all these patients uh, improved after discontinuation of the dupilumab or treatment with steroids. Um, however, this means that because you know that the eosinophils are, can get really high after starting the medication, um, we also advise uh, to check the eosinophils after starting. And we check them actually after four weeks after starting and then three months. And we keep the patient under control, especially in the first periods, um, and tell them also about these risks, why we check it. So you can check the blood eosinophils, um, but you also have to, so you have to be aware of the drug induced hyper eosinophilic syndrome. So if it's related to the dupilumab, that's most of the time the case, but sometimes you have a patient who also has asthma, um, severe asthma, and then it can also be, uh, the hyper eosinophilia can also be because you misdiagnosed your patient. So it could be possible that your patient actually has EGPA, so a different type of disease, and that's why he has the high eosinophils. So always be aware that if it doesn't go well with your biological, be aware, is your diagnosis all right? Check your blood cells um, and talk to your pulmonologist if you have any problems. And together, you will, most of the time, you will figure out what, uh, what will be best to do. Um, for example, if it's eGPA, the advice would be to switch to anti-IO5, which is better for the treatment. And I think it's currently uh, approved for the pulmonologist for eGPA since recently. So, for example, the eGPA, well, you have the high eosinophils, of course, and here you can see some slides with pictures. People can have dyspnea, they can have pain, a swelling around the blood vessels, they can have paralysis or even heart problems. 
um, and the frequency is very unclear because um, I think most of the time it's misdiagnosed or very late diagnosed. So these are all the short-term side effects. Um, and then I also looked into the long-term side effects because many pa patients also ask. So um, there is a clinical study with mepolizumab in patients with asthma, and that's actually the longest follow-up study that we have with a maximum of four and a half years, which is published now. And it says it's very safe for long-term. There are no um, extra side effects. So that's what I tell my patients now. I tell, this is what we know now. Of course, we do not know what the side effects will be in 20 or 30 years, but the expectation is that there are none. And for the other uh, biologics, the, the rest of the information will follow in the future. So this is what I would like to tell you about the biologics and about the side effects. I think it's quite a safe uh, treatment and um, I hope in the future it will be well available for most of us ENT doctors because it, it really can help your patients. Um, and I, well, I would like to thank you very much for your uh, time. And well, let's see if there are any questions. Great. Of course, thank you for, for the presentation. Yeah. Brilliant as usual. So of course we have some data because the trial are going on. It's a pretty recent, of course, so, you know, uh, in regards to omalizumab, there's everything is different between omalizumab and dupilumab, but dupilumab is, seems a quite promising drugs and we will see the, the results in the future. We have some, some questions from the audience, if you don't mind. Let's start with the first one. This is from France. What are the reasons for not having an increase in IgE or the eosinophilic counts after the dupilumab? What are the reasons for this? Yes, because- for not having an increase in IgE. Not an increase in Well, actually we don't know. We, we know that it has, um, uh, we know that it has more impact on the, uh, on the eosinophils, but the IgE can sometimes be, stay very low. So that's why if we check patients and we check them um, before we start the biologicals and afterwards, we always check both. So we check both IgE and both eosinophils because they both can be markers of type two inflammation. And sometimes one is high and one is, the other is low, but I cannot, I cannot explain why the difference is. No, no. The second question is coming from Egypt. Are there any problems or interaction between the actual mRNA vaccines and dupilumab? That's a very good question. Well, um, we, uh, well, the vaccines are given uh, for uh, well quite some time here, and I think in all the countries. And I think we prescribed dupilumab here in this country for already two years, um, and we do not see any, any interactions at all. So all the patients we see, we do not see any other side effects. We monitor all the patients uh, very frequently, so every, every few months. Um, and we noticed if there are any side effects, so they fill in, um, fill in all the forms. Um, but we do not see any additional uh, interaction. No, no, but um, that's a good question as well. And well, I think if there's not an interaction in the short time, there will not be in the long term. I don't think so. No. Other questions coming from Turkey. Would a patient using anti-IL-4 and anti-IL-5 have a less chance for developing antibodies after COVID-19? Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Well, maybe you can answer it. <laughs> um, well, I, I have no clue. No, Puya, do you have any idea? I think that, <clears throat> of course, we know that IL-4 and IL-5 would interact and producing a TH2 pathway. So I guess since the immunological sites for developing antibodies will interact with that uh, in that way, might be plausible to have a decreasing number. However, I'm not sure about this since COVID-19 developed after a natural disease are acting different. So I can't guarantee that we will have a decreasing number. Could be potentially good for a study. That's, that's a good idea. We will see that, we will analyze. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good question and it's very actual because, you know, there's yeah. a lot of things happening right now that we just, we don't know. You know, we will we, we try to keep up doing good work uh, uh, with the COVID, but um, yeah, there's still a lot we don't know. Yeah. yeah. All the suggestions on that field are very welcome. 
course. Um, another question from France. Should a patient use antihistamines during their uh, usage of uh, biologics? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, actually, I, um, if they're already using that for, for their allergies, I would, of course, recommend continue using that. Um, but I do not prescribe it extra. No. So if we have a normal patient with CRS uh, with nasal polyps without any allergy, I do not give, uh, give that as well. No. no. Another question is from Italy. Would you suggest to change legs for each infiltration all the time? <laughs> I understand the question. <laughs> well, you can, uh, you can uh, use the whole body for that. <laughs> You know, we have also, we, we, of course, you know that we, we're not providing those um, online meeting only for doctors. We, of course, taking care of patients and we have people, of course, watching us and they're asking questions, simple ones. So I think that this is a patient asking if they have any problems uh, using, you know, the subcutaneous uh, infiltrations uh, and they changing, you know, probably what we do now in my hospital, we use it uh, mainly in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the leg. Yeah. Uh, and we, we address and explicitly say to patient, use one leg per time so you won't get hurt and stuff like this. Are you using a different methodology? No, no, we mainly use the legs. So uh, uh, I totally agree. And what I advise is that, um, well, you know, for the first period, they use the injection every two weeks. So I would advise to switch from one leg to the other. But it also depends. Some patients have their favorite leg and they do it every time in the same leg, which is fine. Uh, but then afterwards, it goes to every. So after well, what we do, the first six months, we give it every two weeks. If that goes well, we go to once every four weeks and we try to extend that period now. So if it's every four weeks, the injection site is already healed. So, well, we don't hear a lot of complaints about it, it's especially in the beginning. Yeah. So another I, question from Russia. Another question from Russia. How often you prescribe CT scan after initial treatment of biologics? Well, actually we do not, we always make a CT scan before. Yeah, of course, we make a CT scan because, uh, well, it's not to see if there's any disease because you can see it in the nose, but it's to uh, rule out that there are any mucus seals or any other defects or any other problems, which we cannot solve with the dupilumab. So, well, for example, if a patient has polyps, but he also has a big mucus seal, well, that's actually an operation indication. So then we, we perform surgery and, for example, start a biological in the same time. Um, well, and afterwards, we only do it um, when patients are in a study, uh, so only for research, but um, not a lot. No, no. We do it by looking in the nose and grading the polyps, uh, filling out the SNOT questionnaire, doing a smell test, um, and uh, the blood test, so the IgE and the eosinophils. That's what we do to follow up. Yeah. Another question from Spain. What are the limits of biologics when we operate? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, if I would give you that answer in one minute, I would be brilliant, I think. We're all looking for that answer. So, well, I think you really have to, it, it's not about, well, in every study, we, we try to um, say, okay, if you go from grade four to grade two, that's clinical effectiveness. But in my opinion, it's, it's about the complaints of the patients. And the complaints of the patient do have to, um, well, what you see in the nose have to be the same as the complaint of the patient. So if the patient has a lot of complaints and you see grade one polyps, well, you can ask yourself if surgery is really helpful. But um, if it doesn't help enough, you can always perform surgery. And what we are interested now in this moment is, uh, is the effect of surgery better while using biologics? Yeah. But there are a lot of patients we give biologicals for six months. It, it helps, but not enough. Then we do FAST and we continue giving the biologics. Is the result of FAST then better? So that's what we are looking at uh, in this moment. So, well, I would like to give you that in well, one year, maybe one and a half. So that's a very good question. I think the timing of surgery, uh, well, the advice used to be um, to... When you have an operation indication, don't wait too long. 
because if you look, I think in the literature, an uh, article from Claire Hopkins is about the timing of surgery. Don't wait too long because the chances of um, improvement are better when you operate more early. Um, however, with biologicals, these things are changing. So, uh, well, we just have to see. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to add is the fact that because of the postponement of this surgery and the theater because of this COVID-19 pandemic, my experience is that we place a lot of patients under, under biologics by now, especially in uh, uh, dupilumab. The reason for this is that uh, we actually have a lot of tools, new tools. The fact that we are aimed to use more SNOT 22 score, NPS, uh, LAMIC K score to assess patients and to provide a special phenotype of every patient. What we realize is that a lot of patients can be treated even though they did not have a previous surgery. In case they, of course, fail with antibiotic steroids uh, and for a long period of time. And that's, that's the thing uh, that I would like to, of course, stress once again, is the time is very, very important for which we need to address and decide for surgery. Because um, now what we are having a huge number of patients selected with a very, very high SNOT 22 score, IgE and stuff like this, but some of them are responding very well. However, there are some patients that are not responding. And we yeah. can treat them surgically, so yeah. that's that's also my 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 you know my personal question for you. What would you suggest in those patients that are that can be really managed with yeah. uh, with biologic and you know simultaneous drug therapy? What yeah. would you suggest? Yeah, that's that's a good question because well, it's a problem from nowadays because we have all the waiting lists due due to the COVID uh, situation. Um, so I agree it's, it's problematic because sometimes sur I think still, I still think surgery is the best option. Um, so if you look, I think, uh, yesterday, uh, the article was published in uh, the Lancet. Uh, I was uh, very lucky to be one of the, the, one of the co-authors, um, well, it's a I, would, I would have, I would have been honored to address this at the end of our talk. <laughs> <but> <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, no, but uh, well, all the credits are for, uh, of course, uh, Witske Fock, and she, she built all that study and she thought of the study. And it's mainly about, um, well, building up evidence to do surgery. Yeah? If you look into literature, there's not a lot of really good evidence for even doing FES. We all think, you know, when prednisone doesn't help, we, we perform FES. But um, we need some support to keep doing that, also for the insurance and for, for the patient. Um, so in these times, I think it's very important that we still also focus on the surgical part and not only on the biologicals. Because exactly what you say, it's sometimes it's a miracle. For some patients, it's really, really perfect. But there are still some patients who do not react. So what I would, um, what I would say is, um, well, you can always switch biologicals. So I don't know in, in your country uh, what types you can prescribe. So for ENT, we can give her anti-L5, anti-IgE, and dupilumab. And sometimes if patients, for example, have high eosinophils, you can switch to mepolizumab. The results purely for the nose are a little bit less, but in some patients it works better. So I would really advise if you have a recalcitrant case to talk to your pulmonologist see if there are any possibilities. Sometimes if they also have asthma, maybe they can give it for the lungs so you can work together. Um, and otherwise, well, you, yeah, the only thing you can do is um, give the prednisone, sometimes from high dose to low dose, but that's not what we want, no. So we need to do more research about the recalcitrant cases, yeah. And this is the, this is actually the paper that we like to, <laughs> you know, it's, Get it in the Lancet, it's a dream. It was my dream, I had it. Of course, it was like, you know, something different, but this time, very, very compliments for you. And of course, I have some friends in here. What I see is uh, Guiche also, Adrian uh, uh, and and of course, uh, all of the study has been carried on from uh, from Guiche Falkens, which we had recently 
is one uh, like one of our guest speaker. For those interested, it's available in the Lancet, endoscopic sinus surgery with medical therapy versus medical therapy for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyp, a multicenter randomized control trial, everything here. But a summary of this of the study and the finding is that endoscopic sinus surgery plus medical therapy is more efficacious than medical therapy alone in patients with CRS with nasal polyp. Although the minimal clinical important difference was not to met. And long-term follow-up data are needed to determine whether the effects persist. So thank you for <laughs> being here. Thank yeah, thank you, you very much. For having you. And it's what, always uh, wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much. I would like to uh, take this opportunity to announce the upcoming meeting. It's going to be uh, January 25th. The next uh, um, guest is uh, Rishi Mandavia, which uh, is, has been nominated as the president of the European Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery. He's going to discuss about the new Junior European Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery Committee, our plans moving forward. Thank you, Marjolin, for being here. Thank you. You're for welcome. Thank you for your time. It was an honor. Hope to see you so, soon. Of course, we will. And uh, for anyone interested, this uh, meeting has been recorded. It's available on our YouTube channel for uh, um, Vision. I will send you, of course, a link personally, Marjolin, if you want to share it. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, and I love you. Ciao. Bye-bye.